So uh, we're very fortunate tonight to have to have Robert with us, and I just want everyone to know that he brought a DVD and a couple books, uh, a number of books. One of them is the Complete Infidel's Guide to the Quran. Another did Muhammad exist, and they're on the table over here, which he'll sign for you afterwards. Robert's going to speak for about 30 to 45 minutes, and then we're going to have a question and answer period for a while. So, uh, so do me a favor, just don't worry, you will be, have time. <laughs> okay, so if you could silence them, that would be great. <laughs> It's the man with the purple keep up. Which, uh, <laughs> in case you want to go, you know, people sometimes call us a hat. Just so everyone knows, in, in Hebrew the word is kippa, in Yiddish it's yarmulke. Most Americans call it yarmulkes uh, because that's a Yiddish word, which is an old language that was almost dead and now is being revived to some degree. So. So, uh, but you can call it whatever you want, head covering, but, so, um, anyway, and uh, it's not necessary that you don't, you don't have to feel bad if you're not wearing it and you're a gentleman, so don't worry about that uh, right now. If we were up in the sanctuary, then that would be different, it's, but, but don't worry, thank you. So, so everyone will get a chance to, to, to ask Robert, or maybe not everyone, but there will be a lot of questions, and we're very fortunate to have him. So I have this little bio, so pardon me for, for reading it instead of just speaking off the cuff. Robert Spencer is the director of Jihad Watch, a program of the David Horowitz Freedom Center, and the author of 13 books, including two New York Times bestsellers, The Truth About Muhammad, and The Politically Incorrect Guide to Islam and the Crusades. In recent books, he has written include did Muhammad exist? An inquiry into Islam's obscure origins, not peace but a sword, the <coughs> chasm between Christianity and Islam. And his latest book, which I think he sold out already here, but it was here previously, um, was uh, is called Arab Winter Comes to America, The Truth About the War We're In. Robert has led seminars on Islam and Jihad for the United States Central Command, the United States Army Command, the, the, and the General Staff College, the U.S. Army's Asymmetric Warfare Group, the FBI, the Joint Terrorism Task Force, and the U.S. Intelligence Community. So, without further ado, I think that speaks for itself, Robert Spencer. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for being here. We are here in strange times, times when unreality and fiction and fantasy seem to control the public discourse. And what we see with our eyes, we're constantly told, well, that's not true. You don't really see that, or it doesn't really mean what it obviously means. And we can take, for example, just uh, what happened yesterday in Jerusalem. And there was not only the wanton massacre of these five people in a synagogue, but afterward, the Palestinians in Gaza are handing out candy yes. and celebrating. Yes. Yes. And then Barack Obama says, well, that we have to maintain calm on both sides, and too many Palestinians have died. Now, wait a minute. If it were, I submit to you, if it were any other group in any other house of worship in any other country, the outrage would have been all on one side and we would not have these bland Correct. statements of moral equivalence Correct. from the President of the United States. And the sheer savagery and bloodlust of celebrating <coughs> the massacres of clergymen, the massacres of innocent people who were praying, <coughs> would not be, would be the center of the coverage that we would see of this event instead of being shunted aside. 
but it is of a piece with the denial and the willful ignorance that we see again and again and again when it comes to this subject. The key, actually, to understanding what is going on, what happened in Jerusalem yesterday, and what, ha what is happening in, in, in an ongoing way in Syria and Iraq, is a book called the Quran, the Holy Book of Islam. I trust you all <coughs> brought yours today, and we're going to do the Quran <laughs> And so, if you would open your Quran to chapter 62, verse 6, you would see something that gives a clue as to what happens when, why they are celebrating the deaths of these men yesterday. It says, O oh, you who have become Judaized, if you arrogantly fancy that you are Allah's favorites to the exclusion of all people, then wish for death if you are truthful in your claim. Wish for death. If you think you were favored of Allah, then wish for death. The unspoken assumption there is that those who are favored of Allah really will wish for death. And we see this in jihadi discourse all the time. That going back years and years, going back to the, to, to the 90s when the Afghans were fighting the Soviets, they would say that we love death and they love life and therefore we will win. And the Americans came in, and I remember uh, Malana Inyadullah, who was a Taliban commander, saying, the Americans love Pepsi-Cola, but we love death. <laughs> I've never tasted it, actually, but in any case, I would expect <laughs> Pepsi-Cola is preferable. But <laughs> the fact is that to say the Americans love Pepsi-Cola and we love death is obviously working from the assumption that it is to be favored of God. It is a positive virtue to be attained to love death. And we see it again and again, actually, that particularly on Palestinian Authority TV, when it comes to Israel, it is constantly repeated. We love death, they love life, and therefore we will win. Well, actually, I would say we love life and they love death, and therefore we will win. Yeah. And therefore we are actually at the very edge of the, the struggle that runs through the whole of human history, the struggle between good and evil. And that to, to, to love death, to love dissolution, to love disorder, to love chaos and decay and destruction, as opposed to life and creation, well, that is the very definition of what is good and what is evil. Not only that, the Quran also says in chapter 9, verse 111, that paradise is guaranteed to those who kill and are killed. And so the people who went into the synagogue yesterday, they were certain that they were attaining paradise by killing some Jews and being killed in the process. And they loved it because, of course, they loved death. Paradise is guaranteed to those who kill and are killed and the best people to kill of all, guess who they could be? <laughs> of all people, chapter 5, verse 82 of the Quran, of all people, you will find the Jews and those who associate others with Allah in his divinity to be the most hostile to those who believe. Of all people, you will find the Jews to be the most hostile to those who believe. What this practically works out to, what this works out to in practice is that of all people, the Muslims are most hostile to the Jews because they see them as the worst enemies of the Muslims as per the Quran. If you believe that this is the eternal and perfect word of God that, was, that lived forever, do you know that there are three eternal things in Islam? There is Allah, there is his throne, and there is his book. Those are the three eternal things. So he has some place to sit and he has something to read. <laughs> and what he reads, he gave through the angel Gabriel to Muhammad, piecemeal according to Islamic legend, over a period of 23 years. And that is a perfect copy of the perfect and eternal book. In other words, this is far beyond any idea of inspiration that is held in Judaism or Christianity, where there is an idea of a human agent. There is no human agent in the, in the Quran. It is absolutely all the perfect word of God. And if the perfect word of God tells you that you should love death, 
and that you are guaranteed paradise if you kill and are killed, and that your worst enemies are the, are the Jews, how are you going to view Israel and the conflict with the Palestinians? And yet, the one aspect of the whole conflict that is absolutely ruled out of consideration by every policymaker in the entire Western world is religion. And the one thing we're told that this has nothing to do with is religion. And that if Israel gives this bit of land and that bit of land and another bit of land to the Palestinians, then there will be peace. And now, of course, in the wake of this shooting, there are renewed calls for the ending of the so-called settlements in the West Bank. And we're told that if the Israelis will stop and withdraw from that land, then there will be peace, right? Have you heard this? Well, did you re do you remember hearing in 2005 in regard to Gaza yeah. that if Israel withdrew from Gaza, then there would be peace there? Have you, have, did you hear that? Yeah. Did it work? No. Why didn't it work? It didn't work because the book still says all these things about... It's not just that the Jews are the worst enemies of the Muslims in the book. There's plenty more. But I only have, Brian said, 30 or 45 minutes. And there's much more to cover. <laughs> But Islamic anti-Semitism is Quranically based, it is very deeply rooted, and it is absolutely essential to understand in order to understand this conflict. Now, the thing is that we saw what happened in Gaza. Mortimer Zuckerman bought, you know there were greenhouses that the Israelis had built in Gaza. And Mortimer Zuckerman spent $14 million to buy them and give them to the Palestinians so that they would have gainful employ and be able to start peaceful lives. And now that they were not occupied and they were free to live as they chose and they would have a way to make a living. What did they do with the greenhouses? They immediately gutted them and made them into weapons smuggling, weapons smuggling tunnels between Sinai and Gaza to get weapons to Hamas because they love death. There is no withdrawal, there is no settlement, there is no negotiation that is going to make this problem go away. This is not a problem that can be solved. It is only a problem that can be managed. But you will only understand, Americans don't like to hear that. They like to think, well, we can, that surely we can come and talk and we'll come to some agreement and everything will be okay. In the 1960s, you never heard about <coughs> occupation in Israel. Some of you who are as old as I am might remember that. You may, not even, you may even remember that you never even heard about Palestinians until the 1960s. They were invented in the 1960s. There weren't any before that. They were invented as a propaganda piece because Israel was surrounded by 22 giant and hostile Arab states and other Muslim non-Arab states that were just as hostile. And so they were the underdogs, and American, America loves the underdogs. They had to change the narrative. The Palestinian people, which has no history, no ethnicity that is distinguishable from any of the Arabs in the surrounding areas. There was never a nation state, never a king, never a president, never a culture, nothing. It was invented in the 1960s to create an even tinier people so they could be the underdogs against the giant Israeli war machine. You never heard about occupation between 1949 and 1967, and yet Gaza was occupied by Egypt and Jordan occupied the West Bank, Judea and Samaria. And yet nobody said a peep about Palestinians must have a state during that period. Why? Because it's all about the Jewish state must not exist. It's all about the Quran. Yet again, the Quran says in chapter 9, verse 29, fight against those who do not obey Allah and his messenger, and do not forbid what he has forbidden, even if they are of the people of the book, which is Jews and Christians primarily, until they pay the jizya, the tax, with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. In other words, until they submit to the rule of the Muslims. The idea of a state that is ruled by non-Muslims in the middle of what is considered to be Muslim land, well, the Quran says, drive them out from where they drove you out. Chapter 2, verse 190. And so, it must not exist, but these are religious imperatives. The one thing that is absolutely discounted in all matters of policy in Washington and elsewhere regarding Israel. It's the same thing with the Islamic State. 
Just the other day, they beheaded yet another American mm -hmm. hostage, mm -hmm. Peter Kasich, Abdurrahman Kasich, a convert to Islam, and the President of the United States said that this has nothing to do with any faith, <coughs> least of all the Muslim faith which Abdurrahman had adopted as his own. Okay, look, Peter Casey was not a Muslim until he had been taken hostage and he was under threat of death. And after that, his parents only quite recently revealed that under duress he had become a Muslim. Barack Obama, in saying that it had nothing to do with the Islamic faith which Abdurrahman had adopted as his own, he's trying to do two things. Did you catch them? He's trying to, in the first place, of course, as he always does, absolve Islam from any responsibility for the atrocities committed in its name and in accord with its teachings. And second, also, to give the impression that the conversion was something that was voluntary and that had been taken on as a matter of his free conscience, Kasich's free conscience, and thus was testimony to the fact that Islam had nothing to do with this, and that it was just, uh, it, 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 it's a twisting and a hijacking and a perverting of the true religion of Islam. Now, the thing is, Barack Obama always says this. He might as well just have a form ready at the White House, and he can just fill in the blanks. The beheading of so-and-so on such-and-such a date or the explosions and the killings at such and such a place at such and such a time have nothing to do with the great and noble religion of Islam. Okay, a couple things before we see why that matters. In the first place, the beheading. Why did they behead Casey? The Quran in chapter 4 verse 92 says, do not kill another Muslim. So if he did convert, he should have saved his skin thereby. Except Islam doesn't have forgiveness. In Islam, there is no idea that what you have done in the past, even if you convert, you know, it, it, Christianity, you get baptized and the idea is your sins are washed away. They don't have an idea of that in Islam. So in Islam, this guy had been a military man. He fought in Iraq. He was an American crusader. He converted to Islam, great. Well, that means he won't burn in hell for all eternity, but he's still an American crusader. He has to be put to death. So they put him to death. How did they put him to death? They beheaded him. Why did they behead him? Chapter 47, verse 4 of the Quran says, when you meet the unbelievers, strike their necks. Now, what else has the Islamic State done? The Islamic State has cap kidnapped, captured Yazidi and Christian women and made them into sex slaves. And the world is horrified and says, how, what is this savage barbarity? We haven't seen anything like this since the Dark Ages. Where did they get this idea? Well, you know where they got it. Quran. Thank you. <laughs> they got it from the Quran. I happen to have here an edition of the Quran, so you don't have to take my word for it, that has commentary by Sayyid Abul Allah Maududi, who was a Pakistani politician and Islamic scholar. He died in 1979. He was the founder of Jamaat Islami, which is still the largest Islamist party in Pakistan. And he was an Islamic scholar of great renown. He was not a, an extremist. He was not somebody who hijacked the religion. He was mainstream as you can get. If you go, I don't, I don't know if there's an Islamic bookstore in town, but you can, probably there's one in Boston. You can go there. I'm not sure you'd want to, but if you went there, you would find books by Maududi. He wrote a multi-volume commentary on the Quran, of which this is a digest. He wrote many other books. He's very mainstream. You go to islamicbookstore.com online, you will find many books by Maududi. And he gives commentary here. Chapter 4, verse 3, it says, Marry the women that seem good to you, two or three or four. If you fear that you will not be able to treat them justly, then marry only one which sounds great until you realize justly is kind of a subjective judgment, but in any case, or from those your right hands possess. <coughs> what are those your right hands possess? See, this is the problem with people read the Quran and they don't understand why, they don't understand what they're reading because these terms have very specific meanings in Islamic theology that are often not explained. So we have Maududi to explain that. What is what your right hands possess? 
He says, this expression denotes slave girls, female captives of war who are distributed by the state among individuals when no exchange of prisoners of war takes place. <clears throat> so when the Islamic State did this, they were acting in complete accord with an understanding of Islam that is far more widespread and mainstream than anyone in the American media has admitted. Another thing they did was they went around to the Christian homes in Mosul, which was historically a city with a large Christian population going back 2,000 years, and they painted the nun, the, the Arabic letter, the first letter of the word Nasara, which is Christians in the, the Nazarenes, the word for Christians used in the Quran, and they painted it on the door of the, yes, kind of a bowl with a dot on the top, they painted it on the doors of the Christian homes to mark them. So they would come back and demand from them the payment of the tax <coughs> specified. I already quoted to you chapter 9, verse 29 of the Quran that specifies that the until they pay this tax, the jizya, <coughs> with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. Now in that, it's very important also, you hear what Maududi says about this passage. He says that the purpose for which the Muslims are required to fight, note that he says required to fight, not you have an option to go to war, but required to fight, is not as one might think to compel the unbelievers into embracing Islam. Rather, its purpose is to put an end to the suzerainty, the rule of the unbelievers, so that the latter are unable to rule over people. That's a completely universal statement, you see. He's saying that, as he puts it actually in his larger commentary on this verse, non-Muslims have absolutely no right to wield the reins of power in any part of God's earth. And if they do, the believers are obligated to dislodge them from that power by any means possible. The authority to rule, he goes on, should only be vested in those who follow the true faith. He doesn't mean Buddhism. <laughs> Unbelievers who do not follow this true faith should live in a state of subordination. Anybody who becomes convinced of the truth of Islam may accept the faith of his or her own volition. The unbelievers are required to pay jizya, poll tax, in return for the security provided to them as the dhimmis, protected people of the Islamic State. The dhimmis, the protected people. You know how you, Don Corleone, you know, you, you pay protection to the mob and they don't break your storefront windows. It's like that. You pay the protection to the Islamic State and then your lives are not forfeit. Jizya symbolizes the <coughs> submission of the unbelievers to the suzerainty of Islam. And so what I've been trying to illustrate in these few minutes, and of course there's a great deal more to it, and it cannot all be explained in, in, in a venue such as this, but maybe we can discuss more of it during the Q&A. But what I'm trying to give, get across to you is that the Palestinian jihadis of Hamas and Islamic Jihad and the others and the Islamic State are all acting in accord with clear Quranic directives and clear Islamic doctrine. And that when we are told that what they do when they commit acts of violence and terrible atrocities against innocent people has nothing to do with Islam, it's flatly false. Now, why does this matter? Why does it matter if what they're doing is Islamic or not? There are many people who would say, well, we just have to fight them. It doesn't really matter what their motives are, what their goals are. Well, obviously, it does matter because in the first place, it's an adage as old as warfare itself, that you cannot defeat an enemy you do not understand. And we cannot possibly defeat this enemy if we refuse to understand what it's all about. And that is the situation that we are in today. We are in a state of absolute denial about what it's all about. This denial fosters complacency. This willful ignorance fosters complacency, and complacency makes us vulnerable. If we do not understand the extent even of the problem, for example, if we accept the president saying that the Islamic State has nothing to do with Islam, and we do not know that what the Islamic State is doing has everything to do with Islam, then we might assume 
that Muslims elsewhere in the world, including the United States, are never ever going to act the way the Islamic State acts. Well, let me ask you, have you heard, did you hear a few weeks ago that there was a man who had an ax and he was on a New York street and he attacked four policemen with his ax and seriously wounded a couple of them? Did you hear that he was a Muslim? Did you hear that he was acting in accord with orders from the Islamic State itself? which had said, attack military men and police officers, and as soon as that order was issued, there were two military men who were killed, one by being run down with a car in Canada, and another one by being shot. And that there were also, and they specifically said, run these guys down with your car, and there were also two such hit and run attacks in Israel. And so if we just assume that the Islamic State has nothing to do with Islam, why are these Muslims in the West taking orders from them? How did this happen? Why is this misunderstanding of Islam so widespread? And the answer, the short answer to why they're taking orders is because the Islamic State is the new caliphate. The caliphate is the Sunni idea, the Sunni Muslims are 85 to 90 percent of Muslims worldwide. And the word caliph means successor. And coming out of, according to Islamic tradition, Sunni Islamic tradition, coming out of the death of Muhammad in 632, the best man was chosen to be the caliph, the successor of Muhammad, as the military, political, and spiritual leader of the Muslims. And the focus of the unity of the Muslims worldwide, transcending ethnicity, nationality, allegiance to a nation state, everything else. The caliphate was abolished by the secular Turkish government in 1924. <coughs> Every Islamic jihad group in the world has as one of its foremost aspirations the restoration of the caliphate. This Islamic state group, they actually did it, or at least they've been able to sustain it now for five months. But even in doing that, they are attractive to large numbers of Muslims worldwide. And we see hundreds of Muslims from the United States, well over a thousand, maybe even as many as 4,000 from France, a thousand from Britain, hundreds and hundreds from all the other European countries, hundreds from Canada going to join the Islamic State. We never saw this with Al-Qaeda or other jihad groups. It's because of the appeal of the caliphate. But the caliph also issues orders and the Muslims obey. He's the leader of all the Muslims. And so if he says, go take an axe and kill cops on the New York street, some guy will do it, maybe more than one. There was another axe attack in Washington. They haven't caught the guy. But I will tell you with 100% certainty, he was another one following the orders of the Islamic State. It just doesn't happen that somebody decides to take an axe and, decide, and, and kill cops with it. The coincidence would be too great had he nothing to do with that. So why the denial? Why is it that these obvious facts are so universally denied? And I can tell you, they are universally denied. I run a website called Jihad Watch, and what I do is I watch Jihad, and it beats Leave it to Beaver. And <laughs> Jihad, every day, is happening around the world, people committing acts of violence in accord with Quranic commands, and in careful accord with Quranic commands. In other words, you know, why do you have to cut off somebody's head? Why can't you just shoot them? Well, the Quran says so. And plenty of other things that the Quran says, and people do them. In the course of this work, I am looking at news sites and wire services and all these sources all day, every day. And there is a steady stream of articles that I see coming out of AP and Reuters and the New York Times and the Washington Post and CNN, and NBC, articles with titles like, Is the Islamic State Acting in Accord with Islam? And I can tell you, when I see the title, I know the answer, no. They will be arguing no. If I see an article and it says, Does Islam encourage violence? I know the answer, no. Every last one, 100% of any mainstream media article dealing with these topics will be saying Islam is a religion of peace, it's been twisted and hijacked by a tiny minority of extremists. There are Jewish and Christian extremists too, 
and nobody should draw any judgments about Islam from the actions of these people. And every last one of them, unanimous. If there were ever an article, you know, Bill Maher, did you see the controversy with Bill Maher a few weeks ago? And he got in the big fight with Ben Affleck, and he was saying there's a problem with Islam. Yeah. Same thing. Every article, why Bill Maher is wrong. Every last one. If I ever saw the New York Times run a piece saying, Bill Maher may have a point, I would faint dead away. <laughs> How did this happen? It's a matter of the United States government policy. Why it's a matter of United States government policy is another question. And ultimately, I do not know the answer. But I know it's a matter of United States government policy. On October 19, 2011, 57 Muslim organizations, including many with ties to Hamas and the Muslim Brotherhood, they wrote to John Brennan, who was then in the Department of Homeland Security and is now the CIA director. And they demanded you remember Brian said that I had uh, trained FBI and military and all that? Well, that was the last day. Because they actually mentioned me by name and others and said these trainers who speak about Islam and Jihad, they have to be fired. And every last mat training material that mentions Islam and Jihad in connection with terrorism has to be removed from FBI and all counter-terror training everywhere. And Brennan couldn't write back fast enough. And you know what he wrote back on White House stationery? Which is very interesting because it didn't like the CIA is lacking for stationery. Or the Department of Homeland Security. But he wrote back on White House stationery as if to emphasize, we take this seriously at the highest levels. And he assured these organizations that they would immediately comply. The, the date again? October 19th, 2011. If you got my book, Arab Winter Comes to America, I talk about this in much more detail in there. Uh, there were, among the signers of this demand, among the 57 Muslim organizations, was a group called the Council on American Islamic Relations, which had been already designated by the Justice Department during a Hamas terror funding trial in 2007 <coughs> as an unindicted co-conspirator involved with funneling money illegally to Hamas, and which had numerous demonstrable ties to Hamas and the Muslim Brotherhood. As it happens, you may have heard, the United Arab Emirates is right now fighting against the Muslim Brotherhood. The emirs who rule the Emirates, they do not want to see themselves toppled and out of power and the Muslim Brotherhood is a threat to their power. And so they recently released a list of 86 Muslim organizations, all of which have ties to the Muslim Brotherhood, that they listed as terror organizations that would be illegal for, to operate in the UAE. Among them were the Council on American Islamic Relations and the Muslim American Society. It was a great moment that the UAE government is more honest about this threat than the United States government. And not only that, but Barack Obama's State Department has issued a formal request to the UAE that they would clarify why they put the Council on American Islamic Relations on this list. Yes. A group with demonstrable, proven ties, multiple ties, to Hamas and the Muslim Brotherhood. Yep. My colleague Pamela Geller and I, a few years back, filed a Freedom of Information Act request with the Justice Department asking for records of their correspondence and their mutual activities with groups that had ties to Hamas and the Muslim Brotherhood, including the Council on American Islamic Relations, the Islamic Society of North America, and others. We got back this huge box with over a thousand pages of stuff. They have meetings practically every day. They are in close contact. When care was put on the terror list by the UAE, there was a State Department spokesman talking about how they're going to ask them what's going on and try to get them removed. And some reporter, 
to his everlasting credit, said, wait a minute, isn't, doesn't CARE work closely with the State Department? Uh, uh, aren't you guys in close collaboration? And the State Department spokesman said, oh, I, I, I don't know anything about that. <laughs> Next question. But yes, we do know about that, and the collaboration is extensive. Yep. And you have to wonder, what on earth is the President thinking in having the Justice Department and the State Department and other agencies work so closely with these groups? One of the things that came out at that Holy Land Foundation trial, the Holy Land Foundation was once the largest Muslim charity in the United States. It was closed down because after 9-11, it had donate to 9-11 victims on its website that the money was going to Hamas. And it, it's illegal to give money to Hamas. It's a terror organization, so it was shut down. During the trial, when CARE was named an unindicted co-conspirator, there was a captured document that was extraordinarily interesting. The strategy of the Muslim Brotherhood <laughs> for North America. It was never intended to be released. This was an internal document of the Brotherhood and Brotherhood organizations. But it was in the Holy Land Foundation offices. When the FBI raided the offices, they carried out boxes of stuff and we got it. And it says, and I quote, the brothers must understand that their work in America is a kind of grand jihad in eliminating and destroying Western civilization from within and sabotaging its miserable house by their hands and the hands of the believers. Did you catch that? By their hands and the hands of the believers. By whose hands? By our hands. By the hands of Western civilization, you see. They're going to make us tear us down. Not just the Muslims working to subvert, but witless non-Muslims going along <laughs> and helping. So that it falls Western civilization and Allah's religion is victorious over other religions. This is the plan. The, the, this extraordinary document details how they're going to do that, the establishment of Islamic centers and so on. It's, it's very interesting, but maybe the most interesting thing is that it lists the Muslim Brotherhood organizations in the United States. This was before CARE was founded, but the parent organization of CARE, the Islamic Association for Palestine is in there, and every last one of the other major Muslim groups is listed in this. Muslim groups in the United States, they're all Brotherhood organizations. Along comes Barack Obama, elected president in 2008, and again in 2012, Barack Obama, there's a book over here that I uh, co-wrote with Geller a few years back called The Post-American Presidency. We got the title from the fact that in 2008, Obama was photographed holding, he was walking from an airplane to a car, and he was holding his place in a book. In other words, he was so engrossed in the book, he didn't even want to put it down. You know, and these guys, they had entourages and achieves whole life book. But no, he had to have this one with him. He had to get right back to it. He was totally engrossed in this book. And the book was? Quran. No, it wasn't the Quran. That was the <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he had. The, you know, when I used to write after 9-11 and I was working and writing books and such, uh, well, I still am, but I mean, when I'm on airplanes before Kindle, I used to like want to read the Quran on the airplane or some book of jihad or something. But I thought, well, you know, they're going to take me off the airplane and surround me with German shepherds. Yeah. So uh, I would put some other book cover on, on top of it. But <laughs> this was actually the book he was reading. And it was The Post-American World by Fareed Zakaria. Fareed Zakaria is, of course, an acceptable, respectable mainstream journalist. But this book, The Post-American World, argues that world peace will ensue if there are no superpowers. How do we get from here to no superpowers? Well, <clears throat> there happens to be one superpower in the world today, and that's us. And so what do we have to do? We have to weaken ourselves voluntarily, politically, economically, and militarily, so that we're just like any other country, and then there will be world peace. Now, you look at five and a half years of Obama, isn't it a coincidence that the United States is weaker politically, economically, militarily? 
We predicted it all in the post-American presidency, wrote it in 20, 2010, it's all coming true now. It's all abundantly come true. Mm -hmm. But you notice how also well it coincides with the Muslim Brotherhood program. Eliminating and destroying Western civilization from within and sabotaging its miserable house by their hands and the hands of the believers. Now you understand, I'm not talking some crazy conspiracy theory. We can look at the record of what the man has done as President of the United States. And it's not even a partisan thing. I am not coming here to you as a member of or supporter of the opposition party. They are both equally clueless and out to lunch about this issue. Mm -hmm. But the fact is that if you want to understand why this denial, why this willful ignorance that only fosters complacency and ignorance in the face of a real threat, this is one thing that makes sense of it. That he's doing it because he really believes that a weakened America is better for the world. But we got to live in it. And the time for this willful ignorance and denial is long past. If we are going to survive, and if free nations are going to survive in the world. Because the Islamic State and other groups that believe the same thing, they are just going to keep coming. You cannot talk to these folks. I don't know if you understand, you know, we grew up in a world where all the nations abided by certain rules. And there was the United Nations and the Geneva Convention and international protocols of various kinds that all nations abided by. And now for the first time in our lifetimes, there is an outlaw state, a rogue state that does not accept any of that. And it has published maps saying that it's going to conquer all of Iraq, all of Syria, as well as Jordan, Israel, Kuwait, Lebanon. Is it going to stop there? No. It has also published maps indicating its hegemony over the whole world. Now, this is fantasy, of course. It's not going to rule the world. <coughs> it's almost certainly not going to conquer Iraq, Syria, Jordan, Kuwait, Lebanon, and Israel. But certainly many people are going to die as it tries. And the longer we remain in willful ignorance about this, the worse it's... This is a group that already controls a large number of oil wells. The, number, the exact number is disputed. But it's taking in millions of dollars a day of revenue from these oil wells. Who's buying the oil? Our NATO ally and friend, the Turks. Yes. John Kerry asked the Turks to cut it out and to interdict the sales of oil to the Islamic State. They told him no. I mean, from the, the, the sale of oil by the Islamic State. And they, they refused. Why are we an ally of Turkey at all? In what way is Turkey an ally? Turkey was an ally when the Soviet Union was the enemy. And we were in the Cold War. And Turkey was a base <coughs> next to the Soviet Union that was very useful. Nowadays, we are still operating according to these outmoded Cold War models when they have no more utility in the world. And when Turkey has aided and abetted the Islamic State in numerous ways, because they were the seat of the last caliphate, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, the president of Turkey, wants very much to restore the caliphate. He doesn't want to see it in Mosul or Baghdad. He wants to see it in Istanbul. But he thinks the Islamic State can clear away a lot of the obstacles that he faces in the meantime. The Kurds... Assad, maybe even the Iranians, and then he can roll in and take control of the whole thing. He's not going to help us one bit against the Islamic State. But our whole political discourse about these issues is deformed by this denial and willful ignorance. And so it must end. And I will end on that as a call to you, that whatever your situation, whatever your activities, whatever you are doing, in life, however politically involved you are, that you do not allow the political candidates you support of either party to continue with this suicidal denial and willful ignorance. And that we together begin to demand of those who represent us that they speak realistically about this threat and begin to deal with it realistically and formulate honest and effective ways to contain it. Because it can be done. And we can get into that in the Q&A if you want. 
It is not as if we have to sit back and watch them grow. But this unreality is going to be the death of us if we do not dispel it. And right now, that is absolutely our responsibility. Nobody else is going to do it for us. It is up to us in whatever our situation to tell our friends, tell our neighbors, inform everyone around us of what is really going on and work to dispel this fog. The Founding Fathers said, to this great effort, we pledge our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Yes. And they were men of unique courage, but nowadays I'm astonished to find that that kind of willingness is lacking. Yes. I can tell you, however, with absolute certainty, that if we are not willing to risk those things, we will certainly lose them. Yes. And we need to recover that spirit. Thank you very much.